and welcome to Money Mondays with Melissa. This is the month of May. I'm so excited to see you all back here with us for Money Mondays because this has become a very special day every month. We can have great conversations with thought leaders in our city and across our country and share valuable tips and inspiration. We cover everything on Money Mondays with Melissa from generational wealth, from building generational wealth to career opportunities and finance and how to find money for college. Today, in honor of Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we're celebrating Asian American trailblazers. Now, when we say Asian American and Pacific Islanders, we're referring to so many rich and distinct cultures that have influenced and really enriched America in immeasurable ways. We celebrate this observation in the month of May because it marks the anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad on May 10th, 1869. Wow, 1869. Most of the workers who laid the tracks on that railroad were Chinese workers who had to work in dangerous conditions doing back-breaking labor and were paid less than their counterparts of the white American workers. Our country really has a painful history of discrimination of Asian immigrants from the Chinese Exclusion Act and Japanese internment camps during World War II to today's racist acts of violence and terror against Asian Americans. The Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at California State University says anti-Asian hate crimes jumped by 149% in America's largest cities in 2020. This is truly an appalling development. And we all have to do our part to not only stand up to hate, but also to amplify the voices of Asian Americans in our country every day. Shine a spotlight on the incredible contributions of these cultures and individuals and celebrate how much richer our nation is because of them. That's why we're here this afternoon and we have a wonderful panel of guests who will share their thoughts and experiences as professionals in the field of finance and technology. And I'm excited for you all to meet them. And guess what? They are all women. Hey, wasn't done on purpose, but you know that women rock. And so help me to welcome our star panel this afternoon. We have Ms. Grace Reyes, who is the CEO of the Investment and Diversity Exchange. She can wave. We also have Tu Tram Nguyen, who is the Talent Advisor at Salesforce and Corporate Social Responsibility Lead of the Asian Leaders Alliance. We also have Natalie Louie, who is the Senior Director of Product Marketing Strategy at Zora and San Francisco Bay Area Chapter co-lead for Stand with Asians Amer Stand with Asian Americans. And we also have Suzanne Yuan, founder and managing partner at Kinsey Capital Partners. Thank you so much, ladies, for being here. And let's get right to our questions and discussion. So I'd like to start with a round robin question so that we can learn a little bit about you. Can each of you tell us a little bit about your heritage and what AAPI Heritage Month means to you? Ms. Reyes, we'll start with you and then we'll move to Ms. Um, Nguyen, Ms. Louie and Ms. Yoon. Thanks so much for having me, Treasure. Uh, so I'm a Filipino American heritage, hence the Spanish last name. I was born in the Philippines and I moved to California when I was four years old. So I'm an immigrant and I was raised in California, but I recently moved to Austin, Texas uh, this past year. And so for me, AAPI Heritage Month is about recognizing the contributions and influence of AAPI to the history, culture and achievements in the United States. And this year, as we pay tribute to the generations of AAPIs who have enriched America's history and are instrumental to the future success, I also want to make sure that this month and the months going forward that we also do our part to stop Asian hate. 
You're muted. Thank you for having us today, Madam Treasurer. Uh, I'll go next. Uh, my name is Tutram Nguyen. Uh, my parents uh, are refugees from Vietnam. They came to the United States right after the war in search of a new life. Uh, I, therefore, am a uh, Vietnamese American uh, born here in the United States. And I feel like I'm, uh, like many other immigrants, straddle two different identities. One of my parents' uh, heritage, uh, motherland in Vietnam and uh, the one that I've uh, embraced and was born into in America. Um, it's not an easy balance between the two identities, but it's one that uh, I value and I believe, uh, you know, as we look to AAPI Heritage Month, uh, what, what adds to the richness of the diversity in the United States and ultimately what makes our country so great. Um, so as we look at, uh, at AAPI Heritage Month, as uh, Grace mentioned, uh, it's it's certainly a time of reflection to to acknowledge uh, a history uh, that is often left out in uh, classrooms uh, in terms of our contributions to the founding of this uh, country, but also in light of like all that's happened in this, uh, this past year uh, with all the uh, uh, uptick in violence against uh, the Asian American community. Hi, thank you, Madam Treasurer and Melissa for having us. So my name is Natalie Louie. I was born here in the United States. My dad was born here. He served in the Vietnam War and we were raised as patriots. So I see myself as American, I speak English at home. Um, but if you look at me, right, some who look at me, you assume another story. I look obviously Asian descent. So yes, my mom is from Hong Kong. Um, she went through the British school system. She learned English. That's why um, people would say when we grew up, your parents speak perfect English. And I said, well, my dad was born here and my grandfather. My mom went to, my mom went to a British school system. Um, but ethnically, I'm Chinese, right? I'm Chinese American. That's where uh, my roots come from. And for me, AAPI Heritage Month means we can celebrate and talk about the Asian culture um, in a public way, right? I traditionally have my work life and my home life. My home life is where I celebrate my culture. I don't do it publicly, right? And so I think with you know all the hate crimes happening, um, API Heritage Month, it's giving us this month and permission to come out and speak about these issues and talk about the fear we have and what's happening behind closed doors so that we can now blend activism with our lives and with our careers. And um, I did an article for our company where it's not about balancing all of these. Balance means there's trade-offs. Right, you can only do one or the other. Integration is we can talk about work, life, our heritage, um, family, being women, right, being Asian American, African American, all together in one forum. And so that's why I feel like for API Heritage Month, it gives us a platform to come out. But I want the conversations to continue after this together. So thanks. So um, I'm Suzanne Yoon, and um, I'm actually the oldest daughter of South Korean immigrants. And um, I was actually brought to the U.S. when I was just a baby. So my mother and father came to the States so that she could work as a nurse and my father could pursue an education and career in engineering, um, which ultimately led to being an entrepreneur. And, um, you know, I grew up in the north side of Chicago um, in the city and um, I was surrounded by lots of different communities um, and a, really not a lot, um, not around a lot of Asian Americans, actually. And so, um, you know, as I've grown and then um, as a mother of three boys who are half Asian, um, half Korean American and half Irish Catholic, I um, really think, a, you know, the Asian American, you know, Heritage Month is so important um, for so many reasons. I think everything that um, was already mentioned, but, you know, in addition to that, as a mother of, you know, boys who are growing up with, you know, a, a mixed heritage and really identity and understanding really how important it is, you know, to celebrate, you know, their, their Asian side of um, their heritage. Wow, I think this is great. I'm listening to you all stories and um, it's amazing how we're all so very similar. We always say that we're different yet very similar. And so I, I, I love the diversity of this group, but also you, you speak about um, you, many of us are blended, right? Many of us um, have blended families. And so um, I, I just think that this is a great panel for us to have this discussion, how we embrace our heritage. And, and certainly our families are very diverse. So 
That's awesome. All right. Let's also, um, I'm going to start with Ms. Reyes for again for this next question. Um, I really want to hear about your work at the Investment and the Diversity Exchange, which we call TIDE, the Investment and Diversity Exchange. Tell us about TIDE and why this work is so important to you. Ms. Reyes, that's like the statement for 2020-2021. You're on mute. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, well, so Tide was just launched in January 2020. Our mission is to connect movers and shakers to promote diversity and inclusion within the investment industry. And what took other organizations a decade to build, we had built in less than a year. Um, and that's because we had the support of um, asset owners, such as the city of Chicago treasurer's office. Um, and when we first started, an investor asked us, why are you creating this organization when there are a lot of organizations that are promoting diversity and inclusion? And, you know, I agree, it's a diluted space. However, while each individual ethnic group has its own voice, there needs to be a united front. So TIDE has become um, uniquely positioned to be like the United Nations for diversity. And so tying it back to this call today is that, you know, we must address these challenges of injustices and inequalities together. Asians can't do it alone. Blacks can't do it alone. Latinos can't do it alone. So the message that we have for TIDE in the investment industry is the same as for this month is that we must unite together and work um, on these challenges together. Now, just to let everyone know, and, and I like the way our panelists continue to go back to the point of the hateful and the racist acts, and we are we are keeping that at the forefront, but I want to make certain you all also hear what is being said, and, and Grace had mentioned, Ms. Reyes, about the lack of diversity in the financial services industry, in the investment industry, which is all under the umbrella of the financial services industry. So we're going to talk a lot through that today as well. Um, Ms. Nguyen, you're a sales force working in talent recruitment, which is an area that is especially important to me that I'm very passionate about. And this is going to definitely piggyback on Ms. Reyes' question. But I'm sure you know very well, Ms. Nguyen, the excuses that companies give for why they do not have enough diversity. Mainly, they say, it's because they cannot find diverse candidates, which we know and looking at this panel, that is not true. So can you talk about what that means for a company to be really committed to diversity, not just lip service, but really committed to diversity and why that's so important? Right. Well, I can't speak for other companies, but I can tell you uh, from being at Salesforce for the past five years now that um, equality is actually a core tenant and value for Salesforce. Uh, there has been numerous research now that very clearly uh, demonstrates that having a diversity at a company is a smart business decision. Like these companies are more innovative. They understand the power and value and collaboration. The list goes on and on. And so at Salesforce, uh, we actually uh, went a step ahead and last year published our um, what we call our representation goal of aiming to have that 50% of our US workforce be composed of underrepresented uh, groups by 2023. And so I think uh, drawing, a, you know, drawing a line, if you will, like actually setting goals to, to, uh, to, to strive for is really important. Um, you know, it's very easy to just say that diversity is important, but we don't often hear um, about the tangible ways that companies are working towards that. Um, and so that was pretty huge for us. Uh, and, you know, in, I, I'm, I'm always like humbled by kind of like all the kind of multi-pronged efforts that the company also makes in the way of hiring. Um, and so uh, when it comes to uh, uh, leadership training um, and promotions, like we're looking at uh, inclusive hiring principles. We're also doing a lot around training uh, around complicit, um, uh, implicit uh, bias, unconscious bias, that uh, that certainly impacts uh, the ability for uh, uh, people of color, 
to be promoted or even how they are impacted during a hiring pro- uh, uh, interview and hiring practice. And so uh, lots of uh, promotion around employee resource groups. We actually have 12 employee resource groups at Salesforce and it's the leaders at these companies that are um, uh, in communication with the leaders at our company around uh, what we need to be aware of, what we need to address as an organization. Now that's interesting because you hear a lot of companies, as you stated, that says that diversity and inclusion is very important to us, yes. right? But what does that really mean? And so, as you said, that um, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that Salesforce has goals. And you always yes. hear about external goals, right? Goals with who we will subcontract with, goals with vendors. But when you have internal goals yes. for diversity, um, I really think that's something to be commended. So thank you very much. Now, um, Ms. Louis, same question for you. Um, how, well, sorry, <laughs> Second, let me make certain. Where am I at? Okay, Ms. Nguyen, not Ms. Yu yet. Ms. Ms. Yuen, um, Ms. Nguyen. Actually, we just answered you at Salesforce, right? So we are at Ms. Louis. Yep. Don't yes. worry about me. I got caught up with this diversity and inclusion. This is something that, because we hear companies say this all the time. Okay, so Ms. Louie, you work in technology, but I understand that you started in finance. So talk to us about some of the observations that you've had regarding Asian American representation in both of those fields, technology and finance. Yes. Um, so I did finance for the first decade of my career. Um, you know, private equity, worked at a hedge fund, um, you know, uh, real estate banking. So I did that for the first 10 years. And I left because, you know, the Me Too, I always say if the Me Too movement trended earlier, I would have left sooner. But being a you know minority and being a woman, it was hard. I didn't see a lot of people that looked like me at the higher ups. It was really hard to find a mentor. And when I actually looked at some of the, I'll have to say women, um, you know, I, it was hard to be them because they're either you know, couldn't have a family. They had to make trade-offs, right? Or if they did have families and kids and they had to leave early to pick them up, we would sit there and have a meeting and I would see eyes roll, you know, men rolling their eyes. Oh, you know, so-and-so, she had to go pick up her kids. She had to go home. So you see this and I thought, I don't want to be any of them. And it was just really hard to see that. And so that's re- the reason why I left finance and eventually to come to tech. But I do want to get back to your question about, you know, Asian Americans. And I think it's important to bring up um, some important stats and to look at the data, right? I know that a lot of people say that the workforce for Asians doesn't see- seem to be like an issue. Because if you look at it, right, t- uh, Asians make up 5.6% of the U.S. population, yet we're 12% of the professional workforce. So people say, okay, why is that an issue, right? As um, Grace was saying, right, they're not included when you're thinking about diversity and minorities. And But there's a blind spot here. is because Asian Americans aren't considered an underrepresented minority, we're giving a little priority or attention to these different diversity programs, and we're often left out. And an important thing about the Asian American community, it's almost like a tale of two cities or three cities, right? Within the Asian um, umbrella, you've got your um, South Asians, your East Asians, and your Southeast Asians. And there's a very big only income gap and education gap amongst all the Asians when you start really breaking it down. In fact, the Delta is bigger than for any ethnic group. And so when I say um, East Asians, right, that's people from, you know, China, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Mongolia, South Asians are um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, you know, um, Maldives. And then Southeast Asians are people from um, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines. And so when you break down Asians, there's two groups. Some people came here on H-1B visas. They have an education requirement, right? I built out teams that came on those visas. You have to prove you have you know, a couple of different degrees. Then you have people that came here as immigrants, right? Maybe they're searching asylum or they were refugees. So I think when you start breaking the Asians apart, you'll see different groups and different stories. And so I, I do want to kind of give that disclaimer before I start talking about, OK, let's talk about, you know, in the corporate world. Right. That blind spot that people think, wait a second, you guys, why are you worried about this? You do. A lot of you guys are, are a huge percentage of the workforce. Um, and so when you look at the data, right, that's why these 
looking at the data is really important to then have our conversation. Now, when you look at some of this data as well, um, Goldman Sachs, right, they had done a report. Um, this was a few years ago. I'm sure the numbers have changed now. But they said that, you know, 20 percent of its workforce was Asian American. So this is the entry level. But when you start moving up, 11 percent of the senior managers and executives were Asian American. Zero of his executive officers were Asian American. Right. Tech has a similar funnel. A lot of people come in as engineers. Right. They start at the entry level. As you begin to move up and you get to the C-suite. Right. It becomes a very dismal picture. And so how do we go and help? You know, this applies to African-Americans. Right. And so how do minorities band together to say, hey, we need to help not only just get those entry level jobs, but also support each other and move up. Because if there isn't someone that you know looks like you and that's supporting or advocating you, how do you break through that? And so how do we, you know, through these diversity programs, right, that Tutrim is talking about and, you know, put in the policies in place. Now you see California, right? They put out a new policy that said all public corporate boards must have um, diversity. And, you know, two years ago, they said they must have at least women present. So these kinds of, you know, um, new policies that are rolling out are going to give us that chance. Um, but we have a lot of work to do, right, within finance, within tech. Now, okay, so why did I move into tech, which also seems fairly similar to finance? I made the move to tech because I'm from California. Um, I missed it. And I saw tech changing the world, not only with our lives and our personal lives with the technology that we're using, but also embracing a more of a modern day work culture. And that was really appealing to me. And so moving to the Bay Area, transitioning into tech and coming here, I'm, I'm very grateful that as a industry, the technology industry has really make, made those strides, right? With these ERG groups that Tutram and I are part of, with saying things like, you know, not only from dress code, wear what you want, but how do we go and promote more diversity? How do we have these programs? So now we have a Latinx you know, group at work, uh, um, African-American. We just spun up our Asian-American ERG group. Um, I'm starting to see finance companies follow, but tech companies are really the ones leading the way. And so I am hopeful that as they're an example of how to do business better, we're starting to see consulting firms say, I want you know, to do an ERG group, finance firms, I want to do an ERG group, I want more DI, I want a chief diversity and equity inclusion officer. You know, let's hire them. We need more people um, in those roles. And so how do we help other industries to do that? And so I'm, you know, grateful that tech is you know, changing, again, the world we live in, playing and work in. We know that finance has some way to go, right? Even tech has some way to go. But like you said, they're leading the way. Um, and that's why we do the things that we do um, as women in the industry and minorities in the industry, because we know there is a lot of work to do. So thank you very much. Now, Ms. Ewan, um, you're not just a woman in the finance in industry, but you're also a founder and managing partner of a highly successful firm. How would you describe representation in the finance industry from your perspective? You're on mute. No, you're not on mute, but for some reason. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, we do. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so I'm in, I'm in a subsector, I would say, of finance that even has probably a greater lack of diversity than you would see across finance. So I'm in private equity. And what is private equity? Um, we take uh, you know, uh, pools of capital and take control positions in companies where we buy them, we lead them. We serve as their governance entity. Um, we're not trading, right? So it's very unique in that way. And, and I think generally um, when uh, people hear that I'm in the private equity business, I am uh, Kinsey Capital, our, my firm um, headquartered in Chicago is one of the few, I would say, women and uh, minority-led private equity firms in the country. And so they ask a lot, you know, what is it like being a woman in private equity? What is it like being a minority right, in private equity? It's a valid question, um, because I think even in 2021, you know, and it kind of breaks my heart hearing Natalie's story, because I also felt like that my entire career, like I was on an island by myself and just really had to navigate on my own. I didn't have a lot of people who looked like me, you know, in my industry, but I will tell you, I love what I do. And that's really what got me through um, and, 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 and made me really believe that I could bring something unique right, to the industry, um, being a woman and a minority and have a very different perspective. 
So I would say women and minorities are still very extremely underrepresented um, in the private equity industry. But you know, in some ways, I would say it doesn't really come as a surprise to me. So if I look at the most well-established private equity firms in the world, such as like KKR and you know um, uh, CDR, they were all founded in the mid '70s. So right in the United States, this was also when women were first allowed to uh, have their own credit cards. Right, it wasn't until the mid '80s with the Fair Credit Act that women were really given a chance to borrow money to start even their own businesses. So while you know white men, predominantly white and generationally wealthy, were launching what today are these multi-billion dollar private equity firms, Asian Americans were immigrating to the US, African Americans were going to college for the first time, women were just being allowed to apply for their own credit without their father or husband's approval. So we've just not had a lot of time, I would say, to catch up. But, um, you know, my I feel very blessed that I started out of college um, at a company that was also headquartered in, in Chicago, LaSalle Bank, under the leadership of Norm Bobbins, who even then, you know, in the late mid 90s and early 2000s was really focused on the community and making sure that um, the bankers that represented LaSalle Bank and AB and AMRO represented the community. So there was a focus on diversity, I would say early, and making sure that they were recruiting kind of the most diverse candidate slate that they could even at the beginning. So I was really fortunate to see that very early in my career and have a CEO who really cared about those things. And that, um, and so, you know, I still, you know, I, I, I think even as I moved throughout my career away from Chicago to New York and then moved back to Chicago where my home roots are um, to establish Kinsey, that was really important to me. And I think all the, you know, commentary, you know, that Natalie um, and Grace and Tutram, you know, have brought up around the lack of diversity, you know, today, look at this panel, you know, to imagine a panel that looked like this. 20 years ago, I could have never imagined that. But I hope all the young women, you know, and um, and men of color that are watching this are encouraged and know that there is a path forward because of all the hard work that all these people have done. That's exactly what we want to accomplish. That's exactly what we want to accomplish. We want others to see this panel. We want them to be encouraged. So, you know, obviously we, we are here to support AAPI. We are here to stand against the racist acts, the hateful crimes. But we also want to make certain that we encourage one another. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're all in the same boat. We're trying to get ahead. We've had some challenges from, um, you know, and our heritage and different heritage that we come from, but we all know that um, that there is minority representation out there, but we have to support one another. And we know that there is a lot of great talent. So thank you very much. Now, um, one thing that I also um, like to talk about a lot is our young people, because as you said, when we look at each other and encourage each other, we also have to encourage our young people because they're our next generation and we want to see them succeed, um, especially young people that come from underrepresented communities. And so some of them listen to our Money Mondays with Melissa or their parents listen. I want really our guests to talk about a topic that I think could be helpful for our young people. Um, again, especially those in underrepresented communities because their paths are not always clear. So Ms. Ewan, let's start with you. Um, can you talk about, we, we spoke a little bit, I know during the introduction about how you all got to where you are today. And I thought that was great. Let's talk about obstacles that you have encountered and how you overcame them. Oh, geez. I'm sure we all have so many stories about obstacles. Um, I, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I shouldn't have been in private equity, right? I didn't come from money. I came from an immigrant family. Um, but I was really fortunate in that I went to, my mother um, made sure that we went to high school where I was surrounded by people of, of all different um, careers and paths. And Although um, I grew up in a family that was mostly focused on medicine, 
and entrepreneurship, I did see, um, you know, throughout my friends, like I learned a lot about careers in finance and business through watching my friends. Um, you know, one thing that my uh, family is very involved in is really um, education and scholarship programs and just making sure that kids um, that are, you know, I would say underprivileged have access to see different things. And because I think that is probably the most important, like, how do you know it's possible if you don't actually see it? So um, there's so many programs through, I think, the city of Chicago. I'm also on the Chicago Public Library Foundation Board. Um, because I think the Chicago Public Library Foundation offers so many um, opportunities um, to children all over the city. And um, so I'm, I'm, we are just generally like very, um, um, and, I, and, and this is just my own story, but my parents both worked a lot. I, um, as a little kid, would go to the library by myself and just sit and read all day. That was kind of my babysitting. And so, and then when I was 10, my father was, killed an armed robbery. And so, you know, those are the kind of obstacles I think everyone just works through. And we worked really hard. My mother was really focused on my education. I think education is the big equalizer. And, um, you know, one thing I heard, um, I've always thought was true is that God gives, God distributes talent um, equally, but opportunity is not necessarily distributed equally. So it's up to us right? The people on this, on this panel and um, everyone who's watching, you know, to make sure that our children have those opportunities. Miss Yoon, wow. Um, wow. Thank you very much for sharing. And um, th this is amazing. So thank you, Miss Yoon. Um, and now, and, and certainly, I'm just encouraged just by what you were saying, and I know a lot of people are, um, overcoming obstacles. And so thank you for that. Ms. Riaz, your turn. Um, same question. Talk to us about you overcoming obstacles. Oh, on mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I grew up in south side of Stockton, uh, which I think would be, I was doing research last night, uh, it's similar to south side of Chicago. In fact, I googled uh, ghetto cities in the US and the first thing that popped up was first San Bernardino and then the second was Stockton. Um, so my path to where I am now hasn't been easy. Um, but my first exposure to private equity was actually watching Pretty Woman. I saw Richard Gere and I was like, how did he become rich? Like, I want to do what he's doing. And but I didn't know anything about private equity at that time, except for Richard Gere. So um, I did a lot of sports in high school, got a lot of good grades and um, got admitted to UCLA. And during UCLA, I actually had my son, who's now 17 years old, um, and I've raised him on my own since. So even with a demanding career in finance, I was raising my son on my own. Um, so a lot of different challenges. And so I guess for the youth um, or the parents listening, I guess my, um, my advice would be that you're going to come across a lot of challenges, but you'll still come out of it in the end. So I, I just I just want to point this out because okay, so I'm the black woman on this panel, and I, I'm just you all. I'm telling you, I'm blown away, and I know that people um, that are listening are are uh, this this is phenomenal. So first of all, a lot of times we think within our own communities that there is no one that has challenges like we do, right? And there is no one that have obstacles like we do. So Ms. Yoon just spoke about, you know, overcoming at 10 years old, her, her dad was killed by armed robbery. I'm like, whoa, what? And then Ms. Reyes speaking about being a single parent. I want you all to hear this and see these successful women that have overcome these challenges. And we're going to move on, but I just wanted to say that a lot of times we think that these struggles are only ours and that's certainly not the case. So thank you for sharing. Ms. Yoon, were you jumping back in for something? Oh, I just wanted to say I too, my first exposure to private equity was also Pretty Woman. And I had- Wow. This <laughs> 
<laughs> wow. I'll tell I you, me that. watching that movie, I never thought about private equity, but <laughs> nevertheless. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so, Miss Miss Nguyen, let's jump to you. I'd like to hear about your obstacles that you have overcome, but also I want you to add a twist to this because you're a talent recruiter. Sure. So to also hear about some of the stories that you hear and see from candidates overcoming every day. Sure. Um, I, I think it's a, a funny that uh, Grace mentioned, you know, looking up some of the toughest cities in the U.S. Uh, because I actually grew up in Oakland, California, and I'm pretty sure Oakland, California is on one of those lists as well. Uh, so I grew up in Oakland, California, uh, inner city, went through the public school system, really tough school system, um, you know, Grace mentioned, you know, uh, uh, single moms, like there were, you know, a majority of like my, my classmates were getting pregnant, you know, in high school, people weren't really thinking about the SATs. And so I, I came from an environment where not many people were necessarily thinking about uh, continuing education beyond high school. But because my parents um, are refugees or immigrants uh, and uh, Suzanne, so uh, aptly mentioned that education is the big equalizer like that's what my parents instilled in me very early on like if we wanted to um, attain uh, a more financially stable life uh, that we would need to continue our education and so I didn't know how we were going to pay for college um, but I, I, I want to share this because I do think that this is what ultimately helped me grow in my career later on which is um figuring out how to make it happen. So I applied to a bunch of scholarships. Um, I was involved in community service groups. Like I needed to just, you know, cobble together whatever funding I could to go to college. And that's, that's pretty much what I did. I wrote, I knew that I could write. That was kind of uh, something that I, I was good at in high school. And so I was writing a bunch of essays at various scholarships. And so um, I think what that did for me was early on made me realize that you can be resourceful. You don't have to be the smartest person, but if you just keep trying, if you figure out what you need to do in order to, 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 to get it done, you'll figure it out. And I think that that's, uh, these are examples of resourcefulness, of grit that eventually carried over into my uh, interviews uh, in the career world uh, when I when I was looking for jobs later on, um, and so that's for me uh, uh, in my own personal experience uh, as it as it pertains to recruiting. Um, I think that what people often miss is being able to share stories like that about how they can demonstrate that they have grit and resourcefulness and problem solving mentality. Um, and oftentimes you can bring up these types of examples, like obstacles that you've overcome in your own personal life and how that carries over into your professional life. Um, me being able to cobble together different scholarships demonstrates that like, perhaps if I was giving a, a project, I would be able to figure out how to get that project and make, make, make some event, make something happen, make a program happen with limited resources. Right. And so figure out how you can translate these nuggets uh, of experience that you have in your life over to your professional life. Thank you for that. And 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 I think you you made a statement that I think was really powerful when you said, you know, well, first of all, didn't know how I was going to pay for college, right? My family. <laughs> but we but then you also said that I think it's very compelling that um, you don't always have to be the smartest person, right? We just have to learn how to be resourceful, figure yeah. things out. And so we have to learn to endure. And so mm -hmm. really thank you mm -hmm. for that. Um, Ms. Louie, um, I wanted to um, come over to you as well. Talk about, we, we spoke about how you got to where you are, but about the obstacles that you had to overcome to get to where you are. Yes, um, just listening to everybody, I, I came in with, okay, I'm gonna talk about three or four obstacles. Now I have 10 swirling in my head, but I'm gonna refocus back down to just three or four. Um, you know, I think, so there's this interesting book called The Year of Yes. And The Year of Yes was written by um, an author about her dating life, where just say yes to every single date, you never know if you're gonna find your husband, right? So me and my girlfriends applied that concept to our careers and we said, it's gotta be a year of yes, but let's just make it a career of yes. 
Meaning if you get an opportunity to interview with someone, someone taps you on the shoulder, take that interview, take that conversation. And I believe it cuts both ways, meaning go and find a job, find an internship. Uh, when I first started working, I offered to work for people for free. And I remember I had one internship here in San Francisco when I was in high school, and then they paid me, they gave me a check. And I was like, wow, that's such a bonus. And I always had a job when I was in high school. Those jobs then led to me getting my next job through college and so on and so forth, because people would say, oh, you work for a competitor. We want you here. Right. And then you can see how that snowball begins to roll. So, you know, Go and think about every job you can get, internship, opportunity. If someone wants to interview or pull you into something, say yes, because you never know what those conversations are going to lead, right? Never think, oh, that's not an industry I'm good for. Or, I don't know if I want to do that. Have a conversation because you don't know what that's going to lead next. But on the other side, too, as people reach out to me on LinkedIn and people reach out to me for my alma mater um, alumni from the college that I went to, and they say, hey, can I please talk to you about something? Can I ask you about something? I always take that call. Um, I'm busy because I've got three kids, I've got a job, but I'll at least respond to them on LinkedIn and say, yes, you know, happy to, I'm really busy. Can you check in with me in three weeks? Because until we go and we're open to helping other people, um, we're not going to be able to lift anybody up. And so, you know, yes, meaning, yes, I want to go and pursue opportunities. Yes. When people reach out to me and they want mentorship, they want advice, they want help. They want an introduction to somebody I potentially know on LinkedIn. I'm always open to that and saying, yes, that is the only way that we're going to help uplift each other, um, you know, in our careers and our life. Another thing too is Suzanne, you know, you mentioned you had a CEO that supported you. And I was like, I wish I had that right in my finance days, right? Don't think I had that. I have it now in technology. And an important thing to take away from that is when you're interviewing the company, they're interviewing you, but you have to remember you're interviewing them just as much, right? And so every time I interview with a company, I think, is this a leader that I want to work with? Are they going to support me, right? Now it's, you know, do they champion diversity, equity, inclusion? Do, are they thinking about employee resource groups, DEI? Because yes, you want the job, but you have you you're, they're trying to see if they want you but you also equally have to see do you want to work for them and so i think that'll also make you less nervous when you're sitting in that interview and you're thinking i'm also interviewing them as well um so i think that's something important another thing is you know once you do have your career in your job right people always say uh one thing i've noticed is i try not to show up at meetings with new ideas and i try to always get buy-in um, on my ideas before I get to that meeting. And I took a page out of this from seeing my male counterparts, right? Or, um, you know, the, some other coworkers that are not minorities. They're just so confident. They go into the meeting, everybody's on board, we wrap up. You know, I used to show up at a meeting, bring up a new idea, and I'm like almost feeling silenced. And I realized, wait a second, people already have buy-in on their ideas. And so all those conversations that are people having, you know, by the water cooler, one-off, that's where you start presenting your ideas. Now it's one-on-one -on -one Zooms, get that. And so by the time you show up to the meeting, we're talking about how to implement my idea, not why my idea should happen. And so I think that's really important for the women, the minorities here who aren't as comfortable probably doing that and probably didn't learn it from our parents. Um, this is just what I had to learn um, on the job. And the last thing here is, you know, you hear a lot about lean in, right? Um, you know, Cheryl Sandberg wrote the book on lean in, do this. So you know, what does that mean? It means, you know, grab a seat at the table, but okay, well, what does that mean, right? When I want to find a mentor. And so I think it's really important to advocate for yourself. Um, you know, I've been in a situation where um, I was, it seemed like I was almost going to get fired. I was basically told I was walking on thin ice. This was in finance. I had no idea. I would show up, do my work, keep my head down, be really good. And what I found out was my when it came bonus time, my boss, who's not a minority, uh, was talking bad about me to the head of my group because he wanted more of the allocation, right, for bonuses, et cetera. And I sat there and I thought I was going to get this glowing review and I didn't. And I remember being so upset and I said, wait, wait a second. What have you guys been talking about? And I called out my manager. I remember that moment. Um, the head of the group started saying all these things my manager was telling him. And, and I stood up for myself. And I was like, wait a second. That is not true. This is not what's been going on. And I stood up for myself. I advocated for myself. I actually turned into an argument between me and my boss in front of the head of the group. Um, it's at a financial company. I remember shaking and crying afterwards and going into the bathroom and afterwards, I got pulled in to the head of the group's office and he told me, he's like, Natalie, you were walking on thin ice there, but because you stood up and advocated for yourself, you're still here. And then somehow my boss left. 
I don't know if he was let go, if he left on his own, but he was gone. And they said, Natalie, you're going to run this portfolio. You're in charge. You know, we're going to, you know, put you with a new boss. And I remember thinking, oh my God, if I never stood up for myself, you know, I was like shaking, I was crying afterwards, you know, I wouldn't still be here. And so I had no idea if this was happening. So I feel like we as women and minorities, a lot of things are happening behind the scenes and we have to stand up and it's hard. But I want to share that story because I know many people that have had similar stories. When I share mine with them, they go, oh, this is more common than I thought. Thank you. This is giving me the strength to now go back. And if I see that, it, it, you can feel it. You suspect there's something going on and someone's you know, probably not supporting you. Um, I would just speak up and try to have that confidence. And advocate for yourself. Yeah. Women, women, we must advocate for ourselves. We actually, and this is something that I was speaking about to, to another panel. I was saying we're actually taught differently. You think about that women are taught, um, especially I would even say minorities, I taught to be humble and to not brag. And matter of fact, our heritage will shun those that brag. And there's a difference between bragging and advocating. And so I think that that is so key and so very important. And thank you very much for sharing that. Women, we have to advocate for ourselves. Thank you. Um, now, as we go into round, um, uh, my next set of questions, um, I just want to make a quick reminder that those that are listening can certainly submit their questions to us through the, through the chat or through the Q&A, and we'll be getting to those in just a few minutes. And so I really want us to transition into what's happening right now, current events. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and, and several of our panelists spoke about, the, the horrific, horrific events um, of violence against Asian Americans. And although racism against Asian Americans has always been present in this country, um, today we have just seen just so many horrific acts. And I, I want to talk a little bit about that. So I'd like to hear from each of you of what gives you the courage to speak up when you see and hear about injustice. And what I also like about this panel is that you spoke about injustice, not only through Asian Americans, but also through other um, minority um, people that you know have suffered from injustice as well. So I do appreciate that. But either in large scale situations where you're speaking to a group or on social media, or just one-on-one -on -one to an individual who has said something hateful. Talk to me about um, what gives you the courage to speak up. And let's start with you, Ms. Reyes. Um, well, what gives me the courage to speak up is that when I hear of an Asian late American lady getting attacked, it worries me that it might be my aunt, my tita nene, who's uh, 65 years old, um, who lives in Stockton and takes the public transportation. So that gives me the courage to act. And I speak up because at the end of the day, it's not just an Asian thing. It's for all underrepresented communities that have faced injustices. And so that's where I get my courage from. Um, and I speak up so that we can all figure out a way to unite and um, break down the silos and, um, you know, try to try to face these injustices together and overcome them. Yes. Ms. Louie. Yes. Um, so, you know, if you look at kind of like the data on what's happening, there's been 7,000 incidents of hate crimes towards Asian Americans just this past year. And if you think about it, that's really probably the tip of the iceberg. That's what's actually being reported. So for every 1,000 incident that's actually reported through, you know, Stop AAPI Hate website, there's probably five or 10 more happening that people aren't reporting. And I know this because my friends now have had incidences at the gym going to have lunch, right? More so than ever before. And maybe it's a combination of us talking about it, but also just the narrative, right? Of the, you know, China virus and, you know, the permission that our, you know, people have almost been given to, you know, have anger towards Asians. And I think while Atlanta and the, you know, shootings in Atlanta really woke us up, us Asians have known this, you know, um, Melissa, as you've been saying for a long time, right? A lot of minorities have been feeling this for a long time. 
But, um, you know, there's been a lot of stats where you talk to other minor people that are not my, part of the minority group. They didn't realize any of this is happening. So part of this is just education, sharing our stories to say, look, there there is an increase in hate crimes. You know, you're not one of the targeted groups, but we're all suffering here. And so that's why I want to speak up, you know, for that. I want to speak up because I look at the Atlanta women that were shot. That looks like my daughter. That looks like me. That looks like my mom. You know, and I'm starting to hear stories of my friends going about their regular day. And there's like hate incidents is happening to them. They're not reporting any of this. And so that's what's driving me is really to start through education and not only sharing what's going on, but also to talk to people about, you know, there's bias out there, but we've also got some right in our own mind. So for instance, um, you know, I've had people, you know, microaggressions, you know, happen towards me, but also people are trying to build bridges. And for instance, someone will come up to me and say, oh, Natalie, I love Japanese food. Um, you know, I lived in Japan and I go, oh, I'm not Japanese. I'm actually Chinese American. So I have fr some friends that get really insulted. Or you're trying to tell me about my culture and that I'm actually not even Japanese. I'm Chinese or I'm Korean. But I pause on that because that's also in my head. Right. Instead of me being insulted, I realize I can see they're actually trying to build a bridge while they don't realize I'm not Japanese. I can change the narrative and say, actually, I'm not Japanese. You know, I would love if you actually just asked me about my culture and heritage first before assuming, right, that I was Japanese. And so let's take it to that next level and ask people to ask us first versus trying to educate us because they're really trying to do an olive branch and get to know us. But let's not be stuck in our own you know, heads of, oh, react as insulted first, which is typically what happens to us, but then stop and go beyond that to say, okay, let me ask them to ask me more questions. So we ourselves can change the dialogue, which is why I'm talking and speaking up more about this, in addition to educating other people. And so, you know, my, my ask for people that aren't minorities is ask those questions, right? Just ask, you know, you know what ethnicity are you? You know, what is it like to be you, you know, and then just get to know us. And I think that's how we can all learn together. Um, so I love that. Ask. Don't assume. Ask. All yeah. right. That's very helpful. Miss Yoon. So, um, you know, I, I think, Treasure, you started to bring up something that I can certainly relate to. Um, and I think a lot of Asian Americans can. Um, but I was taught to keep my head down, work hard, be better be humble, be quiet. I was too, I was, I was also told as a young girl, I was too aggressive. I was playing too many sports. Um, I didn't fit the mold, right? I didn't fit the mold even within my community, but I had to keep my head down and be quiet. And I think, um, and this goes back to, you know, one of Miss Louie's um, comments is that the Asian community in general is very, the, the, the culture is to, is to hide anything that might be embarrassing, right? So aggressions toward Asians are not reported. That is true. Um, I, I bet it's even larger on scale than what is reported. And I think for me personally, um, what has really given me more of the courage to speak up and think about these things um, is really my kids and how it's going to affect them seeing um, you know, also experiencing as a leader over the last year, um, all the aggression, you know, toward, you know, um, black men and women. And then, you know, this, the, um, the atrocity that happened in Atlanta really shook me personally to the core. And um, I think it rocked my world and made me realize that um, from a very, you know, young age, that all these real life implications of ignorance and justice, right? And violence, um, what violence looks like and the lasting impact it has on families, which is all very suppressed because that's what we were taught to do. And so I recently read an article um, by a journalist, uh, Carl Taro Greenfield. He's a Japanese American writer titled, Asian Americans are ready for a hero. And he discusses the need for a new generation of cultural and political leaders for um, the Asian American community. And he asked the question that's really stayed with me. And the question was, how did we go from being the model minority to the invisible minority to the hunted minority? So it was just an, a reminder that being invisible is just not an option. 
So um, as a leader and someone, you know, we mentioned this, I'm one of very few uh, women um, and minority, you know, run private equity firms in the country. So when you have that type of in influence and visibility, you know, you also have to leverage it carefully and strategically, right? So, and, and I really believe that nothing is more powerful or influential than when you can aggregate a group like this today, right, that have voices um, and, and knowing this gives me the courage to do the right thing and speak up, um, which I think and I hope will only encourage more people to do the same. That's right. That's right. Ms. Nguyen? Um, I, there's, I couldn't have said better than what uh, the wonderful women on this panel have already shared, but I do want to take a more uh, personal uh, perspective in that, you know, uh, something that Ms. Louie and Ms. Nguyen and Ms. Reyes have already touched upon, which is you know, uh, the, the courage for people to actually speak up when these things happen. Um, we know about the reported numbers. We don't know the actual number of incidences. And I think that that really is a, a, almost a cultural thing. Like my parents um, being immigrants uh, came and wanted to just you know, work hard. They don't want to ruffle feathers. They don't they want to keep their head down, kind of keep the status quo, not draw attention to themselves. And so I find that I'm outraged and uh, speaking up because I feel like I need to speak up for them. Like they're not going to, they're not going to speak up because they, uh, it's just not in them to, to want to, to draw attention to themselves. And that actually infuriates me because you know you know people that look like them are are being hurt right now are being killed for no reason at all at all and you know since we grew up in Oakland I think it's you know they almost initially when when all this was happening this past year they almost initially wanted to dismiss it as oh it's Oakland we're in an inner city like crime happens right and I actually had to sit them down and explain to them no this is actually different because this is happening because of how you look um and you know there's there's no other reason than that and it's atrocious but you need to be careful and so it's almost like beyond looking at the bigger picture and educating the greater community i'm finding that i'm having to just have you know direct conversations with my parents to explain to them what's happening and uh and to take it a step further having very difficult conversations around how, how you know you know the media may portray all the all the attackers as looking a certain way well it's not just that it's a more complicated issue than that and these are symptoms of a greater systemic you know issue of racism and, dis and discrimination in our country that has this trickle down effect of of people attacking each other um, and so they're difficult conversations to have and it's it's not one that happens, you know, in a single conversation with my parents. Um, and so it's emotionally taxing, but I feel like they're necessary to have. And, you know, the more I feel I can talk to them about it, my hope is that they're talking to their friends about it. And they're all, you know, there's a ripple effect of them uh, wanting to understand, you know, the greater movements that are happening uh, so that there's more education and awareness around what's happening. So uh, again, going along the lines of us being so very similar, um, I was just listening to you all reminding me of something my mother would say, right? Oh, no, 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 don't say that. And, and just let it go. And, you know, um, our parents, God bless them. You know, they did what they felt they had to do. And in so many instances, they were afraid Right. So when they said, keep your head down is because they wanted us to be safe, um, which is horrible. Right. That that it had to be like that. Um, and so we're so grateful of, of the the way that things have progressed. But the reason that we're having this conversation is because certainly it's not where it needs to be. But there's so much more to go. And um, obviously, there has been some way that we can openly have these conversations. Um, but certainly, more conversations have to be made. And um, this, this, this has been really great. So thank you um, for responding to that. 
And now we have our last question. Um, and this has been a well, well um, performing panel that we had on today. But again, if there's any questions coming in, I think ladies that we're just ask, answering all these questions and everyone that's attending, they're just listening to what we're saying. And it is very great information. Um, so last question. So in the midst of all these hateful acts, we have seen solidarity across ethnic groups, particularly in young people. And I always say we learn so much from our young people. Young people who understand that whether we rise or fall as a country, we do it together. Can you each share your thoughts and on this particular moment, and what you think the future holds for Asians and Pacific Islanders here in America. Ms. Louie, now you are the San Francisco Bay Area chapter co-lead for Stand with Asian Americans, which is the group that created the Wall Street Journal Enough page asking businesses to support the AAPI community. So I'd love to start with you for your perspective on the need for alliances and what those alliances will mean for the future. Yes. Um, so, you know, if you kind of look at our history, right, the 1950s and 60s civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King, that was 60 or 70 years ago. And it set the groundwork and the, you know, the platform for all of us, you know, women, you know, not only uh, African Americans, but Asian Americans. So all minorities benefit from that. But that was 70 years ago. I think this next civil rights movement that we've done, right, from BLM to now stop the Asian hate, I, I don't think it's going to take 60 or 70 years. But what I'm hearing is it could take five or 10 years. So, you know, a lot faster. We're moving quicker with, you know, the internet, with access to information, and, you know, from what people have done before us. Um, so that is my hope it's going to move a lot faster. Probably not, you know, the next year, but more five or 10 years is what I'm hearing. And if you think about SWA, which is Stand With Asian Americans, you know, their goal is to get 10,000 signatures of other people standing with us and raise $10 million. And if you look at right their goal and their mission, what they want to do is, you know, they want to you know smash the model minority myth and create a new movement for Asian activists that are striving for human dignity in all spheres swap out African-American activists that are striving for human dignity in all spheres, Latinx activists striving for human dignity in all spheres. You can swap that out. We're all in it together. And you're, I mean, this is, you know, talking about private equity, you know, Suzanne, this is your typical private equity roll up. All these different coalitions and groups are working together. So SWA is also working with TAF, which just recently launched, and that's the Asian American Foundation. When they did their launch event, President Obama, Clinton, and George W. Bush opened, and they want to serve every Asian American Pacific Islander and to anybody community in their pursuit of belonging and prosperity that is free from discrimination, slander, and violence. Everyone feels that way. Anyone can get behind that. And so it's not just us, right? These mission statements are for everybody. Uh, we're trying to work with Launch. That's the leading Asian Americans to unite for change, right? Eric Toda is on the board of that. He's on the board of TAF. He's working with SWA. I talked to him and their mission is to engage and empower Asian Americans know, all minorities, to fight racism, increase representation, and share community resources. So if you look at all these organizations that are working and aligning, you know, it's not just for Asian Americans, but it's for everybody. The pace and the speed at what we're working together at, I can, you know, I'm, my hopeful, my hope is that this is going to happen in the next five, 10 years, you know, not 60 or 70. Yes, we are hoping, right? We always say that we are fighting today because we don't want our children to have to fight on these same issues. So yes, thank you. Ms. Nguyen, on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I, 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 um, I uh, love what Ms. Louise shared because one point she, she mentioned that um, I find particularly fascinating is it'll be interesting to see the role of technology platforms uh, as a tool uh, for organization moving forward. Um, we saw, you know, you know, we we we've been in under lockdown this past year, right? So it does make it a little bit more difficult to rally to to get together in large groups. But because of technology, we've been able to organize in a completely different way, and and and, and even virtually. Um, you know, uh, in the aftermath of the shootings in Georgia, 
um, several leaders of different ERGs got together um, and organized an event that was attended by over a thousand uh, Asian American uh, professionals and their allies just to discuss, you know, the advent of violence against Asian Americans and how to be allies. Um, that was organized over just a couple of weeks, um, and it had such, you know, an explosive number of attendees that I'm just amazed and and humbled by the use of technology to to round up people that have a like minded cause and motivation. And so I'm I'm interested in seeing how uh, these platforms and tools will continue to allow and amplify these messages that are pushing for social change. Absolutely, Ms. Reyes. Well, I'm quite hopeful that the AAPI community will have a brighter future. Um, just by looking at these panelists, um, most of them I, I've known for many years, uh, actually to uh, Miss Nguyen and I went to college together. That's how we knew each other. Um, and so I feel that I look at them and I see that they're not one to stand on the sidelines. And I'm confident that they're a force to spark change. And I'm confident that will create progress. Wonderful. Ms. Yoon. So I, you know, I, I think just generally, I agree with, um, you know, most of the comments um, that have been made. And I'm, I'm hopeful that this all raises, you know, important conversations about race, racism, and really how everyone has to be engaged in order to understand and stop hateful acts. Right? And um, I do think that education is one of the best ways to increase that acceptance. And then the public and private partnerships. So not just, you know, it's business, philanthropy, and um, the political, you know, leadership in this country really need to come together. And I think I'm, one thing uh, I am really um, excited and proud of is that, um, you know, the, the um, and to live in Illinois, where they are, you know, we're on the verge of passing the Teaching Equitable Asian American Community History Act, um, which would require, right, the teaching of Asian American history in our public schools. And I think this, uh, by mandating the curriculum, you know, the TEACH Act would help create a more robust and cross-cultural education for all students, because we don't have to, we really have to educate all minority groups about AAPI and about each other. You know, it's not just, um, you know, the white, you know, majority, it's everybody so that we can, we can kind of live in harmony to, you know, um, I think Ms. Nguyen's point is, you know, we don't want this for our children. You know, we don't want our children to have to fight the way that we're fighting for this today. Yes, absolutely. And um, one of the statements made um, on Facebook, we're streaming to Facebook as well. One of the statements made was, it seems like in the media, when we see the violence against the Asian community, um, the Asian American community that we see, um, it being done by African Americans from what the media portrays. Um, and certainly as you all stated, there are a lot of instances that are not reported. Um, there is so much um, hateful crimes out there that we don't even know about. And so I think that, um, well, first of all, we know that it's way beyond the media. And we all know that um, as we really shed light today, that we all come from very similar backgrounds, maybe different, but very similar, similar challenges. And we have learned to overcome. And so there's so much more work to do. I think that panels such as this provides awareness. We talk about education and awareness. I'll tell you, it has certainly even been enlightening for me. And um, I, I certainly consider myself a well-rounded person and I've learned a lot on today. So I appreciate, we had a dynamic panel and I know that that is the reason that we were answering all the questions. And I think this has been enlightening for so many. So I truly want to thank this dynamic group of women 
that joined me on this afternoon. And um, that I know we went right until 1.15 and we are happy about the time that we spent together during the lunch hour. So thank you again, wonderful conversation. We'll be sharing additional notes and materials to everyone that attended through email. So please watch out for that. Also, I always wanna remind those that are watching us through Facebook. Um, that's great and we always wanna stream live, but make certain that you register for these events because when you register, you get to receive additional materials from us by email. So make certain that you do that. Um, and also, always, if you can't get to us through social media, go to our website, chicagocitytreasurer.com. And then also you can learn about all of the future events and things that we are doing. Continue to follow us on social media with Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. We are on them all. Thank you again um, for joining us today, Money Mondays with Melissa, and happy Asian American and Pacific Islander Month. Thank you, ladies, for joining and continue to do the great work that you are doing.